Why don't we move on and talk about inflammatory lesions of the around the hip? And we'll talk about infections, uh, soft tissue, local, hematogenous, and osteomyelitis. To uh, start with, and then we'll go on to systemic inflammatory type diseases. So, uh, Michael, why don't you start with this one? Hi, John. You just join us? Okay. I just got the link. Okay. Good. Okay, great. M Michael, go ahead. All right, so 34-year-old male, left thigh pain and edema. He has a history of uh, diabetes and chronic liver disease. Um, he's got some labs which are notable for really high glucose, really high A1C, elevated CPK. White count is 7,000, and CRP is elevated. Um, so you see marked edema involving the superficial soft tissues and the deep uh, muscular tissues of the thigh. Uh, let's see that's post-contrast images on the left. So it looks like, you know, in the post-contrast images within there, I mean, there's marked edema throughout the superficial soft tissues and the uh, hamstrings as well as the, and it looked, I was wondering, can we go back? Is there like a rim enhancing kind of collection within the center? Although I don't see focal fluid collection. I don't see a focal fluid collection on the fluid sensitive sequences, but you have this enhancement. Like, I don't know if that's. Um, you have this area that's low on signal here. Like, that's either blood products or even uh, maybe like necrosis. Okay, good. Here's an ultrasound. Um, here's ultrasound. I assume of that area where you see this kind of low signal, kind of amorphous, which I assume that's made the area of. Um, edema and inflammation and there's little scattered areas of uh, vascularity within it. So the impression was yet yeah, diabetic myonecrosis rhabdomyolysis. And that's what I, it kind of looked like just uh, necrotic tissue. But I guess you, the white count was normal, but I still feel like you'd have to be worried about some sort of uh, infection as well. Yeah, yeah. this was diabetic uh, myonecrosis. Uh, which is thought to be a uh, ischemic lesion. That patient was basically treated with antibiotics and NSAIDs. Here's three weeks later. Um, I didn't see a C-reactive protein. Uh, was there one? Uh, the yeah, it was elevated. It was like two point four. Uh, that's not very high. Um, so I I don't. The fact that there's no swelling uh, would kind of push me away from uh, infection. Yeah, and then the white count is pretty normal. Yeah, so uh, the white count sometimes can be uh, not necessarily elevated when yeah. the patient's are real sick, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, but uh, the fact that there's no swelling uh, well, why which, do you say there's no swelling, John? We see a lot of edema here. Um, actually, uh, I, I think I'm I'm wrong on that, John. I, okay. I think there is swelling. Okay. So this but is three I weeks later. I was looking at the other leg, and I said, "Wait a minute! I don't know. Is that is that fat, or is that a?" Um, Fluid. Yeah, see, I think he's got bilateral disease here. Yeah, it's that's what got me. It is a bilateral. Um, we're looking at two legs, and they're both the same, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, I can't really tell whether there's a real swelling or not. Yeah, here. That would here be kind of, um, uh, the, the fact that they're bilateral. If this was infection, it, 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 it'd be a dead man walking. Right, right. And then here we can see a little bit. You can see the striations here of the uh, within the the muscles, a little bit of edema. So the the pathologic diagnosis was uh, uh, necrosis and some acute inflammation. All the cultures were negative. So this is really a diabetic muscle infarcts or diabetic myeloid necrosis. Uh, it's a rare complication. Uh, and, and there really wasn't pus, was there, John? No, there wasn't, exactly. 
So this is more chronic with poorly controlled diabetes. Or diabetes out of out of control without yep. anybody paying attention. Right, exactly. Okay, Jennifer, what do you think of this? Um, here we can see that there's superior subluxation of that right femoral head and dysplasia of that right acetabulum, and there's just diffuse muscle atrophy of the right hip and thigh muscles compared with the contralateral side. Um, so I'm not sure if this is sequela of remote trauma or this is congenital. Well, we're in the inflammatory disease section. So that last one, I guess you could say wasn't inflammatory. Um, this is probably polio. This yeah. may reflect sequela prior polio infection. Yeah, this with, is um, polio. Yeah. So this is what happens when you have chronic uh, loss of the muscles, denervation of the muscles, and then you get remodeling of the bones because of the lack of the normal uh, tension on the bones of the muscles. And so you can see the, the muscles are really important for a lot of the normal morphology of the muscles. When you lose it, the muscles, the bones just don't uh, develop properly. So that's polio. Good. Here's another case of polio where you can also see dislocations due to the loss of muscle control. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? All right, to uh, coronal imaging, um, looking at the right hip, the femoral head, it looks quite deformed. There's a big effusion. There's some um, remodeling. Uh, there's a lot of atrophy within the musculature, atri um, both sides, but uh, looks, looks like this is focal degenerative change, yeah, monoarthritis. Yeah, the, the, this was the sequelae of chronic joint infection that's not properly treated, so you really don't want this to happen. Okay, uh, Michael, right hip pain. Okay, so... There's abnormal signal in that superior acetabulum on the stir sequences. It's markedly uh, hyper intense with low intensity on the uh, T1. I think the cortex of that acetabulum still looks intact, and the femoral head looks fairly spare. There is a joint effusion, though, a pretty moderate joint effusion. Um, and this is a young kid. Uh, and there's, yeah, there's some little fluid collection since. I guess for the joint effusion, young kid, you have. Uh, Ooh, looks like probably bursal effusion. Yeah, that's so it's bursal effusion. Good. Yeah. And so in a kid, you'd have to worry about a, uh, you know, joint infection whenever you see a joint effusion. It's a little weird that only the acetabulum was edematous, I felt like, though. Yeah, so yeah. it is a uh, staph, oh, you know, an infection. Yeah, you're right. You have to think about infection, and these are emergencies. These have to be diagnosed and treated Im uh, immediately. Okay. Okay, this is increasing pain after trauma, Jennifer. Um, okay, now I can hear you now. This is increasing pain after trauma. Um, trauma. It seems like there's some soft tissue swelling along the lateral thigh. I don't see any osseous erosions. There's some irregularity there along the lesser trochanter. And then here we can see diffuse marrowedema within that proximal to mid femur and there's some periosteal reaction. Yeah, you can actually see the periosteal reaction here, but it's more subtle. That's what this stuff is. Yes. Okay. Okay. So here again, we have periosteal reaction. Would this be like a Boeing fracture? Uh, um, inflammatory disease here. Inflammatory. I guess, I mean, if he had a penetrating injury, it could also be a Brody's abscess. It looks like there's a fluid signal intensity tract here extending from the medullary cavity to the adjacent periosteum and there's periosteal thickening so this may be reflect a Brody's abscess. Yeah well this is really a chronic osteomyelitis picture it's uh, 
Brody's abscesses would be in a kid. They would be very focal in the uh, metaphyseal region, not the diaphyseal region like this. The Brody's abscess would not be this extensive. Uh, this is much more severe disease. And with the Brody's abscess, you typically are not going to see this kind of chronic uh, 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 periosteal reaction and, and the cortical thickening in this patient. This is a chronic osteomyelitis picture. Mark thick cortex. Definition, it's not a Brody's abscess. Yeah. So it's osteo. Uh, yeah. This is, I, I can't imagine this being a, a US of A. Uh, although yeah. I suppose every case like this that I saw in my years of practice uh, uh, with kids that uh, came from overseas someplace or Mexico. This is, well, I don't know where this person came from, but this patient was imaged in Beverly Hills. Well, I, I, I can imagine that, John, but that could be from another place. Sure, it could be. All right. Ashley, what do you think of this one? 46-year-old female with excisional biopsy for grade 2 liposarcoma on August 31st. Positive margins led to CT on October 1st. Further resection October 9th. Um, okay, so we're looking at the CT from October 1st, the pre and post. Doesn't look like, I'm uh, looking at the uh, medial aspect, um, or is it the no, lateral aspect of the thigh there? And I, I, I honestly don't see a fat containing lesion. That looks like a post contrast, looks like some, some enhancing uh, intramuscular, uh, you know, abscess, or okay. uh, could be an intramuscular abscess or um, seroma. Um, so that's a pre like, this is the post. Yeah, now grade two, grades and so forth. But remember, uh, uh, a lot of liposarcomas, especially higher grades than this, aren't going to have necessarily detectable fat on an imaging study. Uh, they they have fat uh, under the microscope, but not necessarily on imaging studies. Okay, so here, but here further. Now this is this is the CT scan on. October the 1st, uh, bef uh, before there is further resection. Then the patient had resection, and now this is November 27th, a uh, month and a half after the further resection. Well, I mean, this looks like fluid. Um, it's quite a bit uh, increased in size and much more increased than you would guess for recurrence. I, and it has that nodular uh, appearance of an abscess. I, 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 you know, given that they recently resect, I, I would be concerned for a intramuscular abscess here. Yeah, this was a step abscess, step abscess, and in retrospect, this is probably an abscess as well, rather than recurrent mat tumor. Every time you put a knife to somebody, that's the first thing to think of afterwards. Yeah, just 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 one second. Something like this happens. I'm just in the middle of a lecture. Yeah. Do you need to talk to me? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to, uh, why don't you talk for a minute? I'm going to have to, uh, I'll be back in just a few minutes, okay? Sure. Take your time, John. What's going on in your world, guys, girls? Oh, not much. Just, uh, it's been like, I think we've been in fellowship for eight months. I feel like I'm finally getting the hang of it. <laughs> oh, I think you guys are doing a very good job. And, uh, and what I've uh, seen in the last 20 years or so, it's, uh, the crew seems to be brighter every time, every, every year. If not, maybe brighter, uh, at least more knowledgeable. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, it's a good thing, John. I, I'm not sure I can handle these bright guys. <laughs> They're bright. That's right. Okay, let me get the images back up again here. Okay. All right. So let's go on to, to this one. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this one? A 30-year-old female with AML and vague thigh pain. Um, 
So in her left thigh, she's got quite a bit of ill-defined kind of increased signal. It kind of looks like edema within the hamstrings or... Okay. Um, and this is four weeks later. Now we still see that, uh, or within the adductor, sorry. Um, within the muscles, now there's a focal fluid collection with uh, peripheral enhancement. So I guess I'd be concerned for like a myositis and now abscess, or probably less likely, ne you know, necrosis. So worried for an intramuscular abscess. Yeah, this again was a staph abscess. Good. Okay, uh, Jennifer. This is an old CT scan of someone with left hip pain. Okay, so here we can see a focal fluid collection there along the left um, iliacus muscle. It could be suspicious yeah. for an abscess. Yeah. There's enlargement of that muscle compared with the contralateral side. And this is a very early MR scan. Uh, okay, so there's, stir image. I guess this is stir, increased stir signal intensity yeah. there within that muscle again and within the adjacent um, gluteal muscles. Yeah, it's on both sides, which is common when you get abscesses in this location, which is a pretty common location for abscess. And this was an iliosoas abscess. And uh, if you go back okay. on the CT, it was hard to call this muscle abnormal, but in retrospect, it was a little bit more thickened than on the other side. So there's inflammation that went through the bone and was involving both sides, which turns out to be a common okay. occurrence. Please, good. Okay, and then here's just a big abscess here in the, in the hip and so yeah. on else. Okay, uh, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? 41-year-old um, female, asymptomatic mass, right lower abdomen, palpable. It looks like it's uh, it's very cystic. It has kind of thickened uh, peripheral rim enhancement. Uh, it's involving the um, right psoas. Um, it's fairly large. Um, it seems to be a second cystic focus more inferiorly within the psoas. I'd still be worried about an abscess, although the patient's asymptomatic. Um, not sure. Are we looking at the this shows the rate of uh, enhancement going up, which is, this is very rapid, which would make it consistent with inflammation. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd be worried about an abscess. And it looks like there's some calcification there. So, uh, so you, but you didn't come up with the organism. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> And here I was telling them how bright these guys were, John. <laughs> yeah. No, this is the first first and only time, or this is the only time I've actually seen this organism. No. It's the only time I ever heard of it. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, Michael. Okay, so MRI of a right hip. Um, there's a you know, skin marker on the posterior aspect. Uh, so where the skin marker is, there's um, kind of soft tissue defect, maybe ulceration with edema and kind of a, right. looks like a tract extending deep until it surrounds this hypo-intense structure. Okay. Um, and it looks like that can, you know, this might be like a sinus tract, which might extend to the greater trochanter, it looks like. Not sure okay. if the greater trochanter is definitely involved. I'm not sure if that hypo structure could either be, um, either some metallic, it doesn't really look metallic, either calcium or air or a uh, possible right. prior like hemorrhage. Yeah, well, this, this actually- But I would be worried about like an infectious type sinus tract. So and that's a the sinus tract. And, and right there, yeah, you can see back on the axials on the T1, it does look like the greater trochanter is like, you know, the edge of it, the cortex is pretty irregular. And so it might be, you know, like chronic sinus tract and osteomyelitis of, I don't know if that's a foreign body or something. What do you think caused this? Uh, this, I mean, you see this like, you know, patient who is like, you know, laying in bed all day. Like we see it in like the chronic hospitalized patients with chronic yeah. osteo and it's no one chronic protection. nursing care. Yeah, that's a typical bed sore, right? Okay, uh, Jennifer. 
Okay, so 36-year-old with multiple subcutaneous nodules and purulent discharge along both buttocks for one year. Um, here we can see multiple subcutaneous nodules that are enhancing and increased in T2 signal intensity. Um, not sure if he may have some other type of systemic disorder that could account for this. Uh, it looks like there's probably surrounding cellulitis. Um, so what do you think this is? Uh, if, well, if he has another systemic disorder, this could be that, it's called, I think, pyoderma something, ah, uh, hydrodenitis. Yeah. Thanks. They, it, he, they ended up having debridging skin disease. Again, this is another form of bed sore where, with, as John was saying, not proper nursing, they weren't turned enough. And so you, you get compression of the skin, poor uh, you, you get sores on the skin, you get breakdown of the skin, you get infection and, and, and poor perfusion, and this can lead to chronic infection of the skin. Uh, the treatment is extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we have not, now, now we have special uh, locations where treatment is carried out for this kind of a problem. Yeah. Uh, it becomes specialized. So a lot of your organelles get infected here. <coughs> okay, uh, Ashu. Um, so this is a 42-year-old male with a thigh mass are we at the level of the testicle? This, or is, the, is, this, this is the knee here. This is yeah, the so thigh. The, oh, that, that's not a normal thigh. Um, not a normal thigh. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's extremely enlarged, and there's a lot of uh, edema within the superficial adipose there. Um, edema? Uh, well, I don't. It, it looks like it's edema. I, uh, what kind of tissue is it? Uh, it's within the it's within the fat, um, but it I, I feel like it's it's like a like, um, you know you get those like lymphatic obstructions and yeah, there you go it's lymph yeah lymph lymph lymph, lymph. okay elephantiasis yeah so what what is elephantiasis um isn't that uh, so elephantiasis doesn't it refer to uh, Lymphatic obstruction secondary to bacterial or parasitic uh, infection? It's usually filariasis. It's okay. not a bacterium, but it's filariasis. The most common in Africa, isn't it? It's most common in Africa where they have red red soil. But it's yeah. uh, this was in Southern California, so you can get it in Southern California as well. But it's that you get swelling like that due to lymph obstruction from the little worms blocking, going into the uh, lymphatic system and blocking the lymphatic drainage. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's uh, Michael. Okay, uh, so we have chest x-ray and abdominal x-ray. Filariasis, so, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Filariasis is a common cause of that right. elephant stuff. Um, so on the abdominal x-ray, I see multiple kind of punctate and linear calcification just kind of scattered throughout the entire uh, kind of abdomen. Over on the left, it looks superficial, you know, and they're overlying the bone, so I'm not sure. On the left, it looks like they're actually probably fairly superficial. And then you see scattered all across the chest and along, like, you can, you can see it along the chest wall, overlying the left and right breast and axilla. So assume it's probably like soft tissue calcifications, maybe in the superficial fat throughout, or the muscles are less likely. So um, and it, it says multiple masses, both thigh, eating snake. 
So I would assume this is going to be some calcification of like a, you know, some sort of parasitic infection. And we kind of have sheet-like calcification. And that looks really superficial. So I don't think, I guess other things you see when you see like sheet-like calcification, like this dermatomyositis. Um, yeah. But I'm going to assume this is some weird like, you know, calcific larva. Yeah, this is sparganosis. I, I have the displeasure of treating a family with this problem from eating a pork sausage that wasn't wasn't cooked. cooked. Yeah. But the, the only patient in the family that didn't get the disease was the mother that cooked ah. or missed. Sampling her food while she's cooking. Yeah. And you? they were with five temperature, I remember. I thought they were going to die on me. Wow. But I was a student. Jennifer? Okay, so similar, we have a 68 year old male with an inguinal mass and history of eating raw snakes. And this is probably another case of tapeworm infestation with calcified yeah. larva. So you can oh, no. stay away from those raw, raw snakes. Yeah, the snakes don't have trichinosis, so pigs do. Right, right. They have sparganosis instead. Okay, uh, Hashu. And, and poison. Yeah, right. Uh, it's a three-year-old girl with uh, pain after fall. Um, see a lot of periosteal reaction. I don't, I don't know. This this fall there is a fracture of the distal femur as well. Um, I'd like to see. Okay, so yeah, it's extensive periosteal thickening, and um, it doesn't look like the fracture is healing very well at all. Um, you see a lot of uh, fluid and edema within the soft tissues and extending within the bone. This looks like osteomyelitis after fracture. Um, yeah, uh, uh. Osteomyelitis then and a pathologic fracture. Yeah, uh, yeah, pathologic fracture. Because yeah. this is this is chronic osteomyelitis with a lot of periosteal reaction. We see that right. we see the fracture. hemorrhage and fluid level. Immobilized. Yeah. So th this was actually a chronic osteomyelitis that then fractured. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael. Okay, so 38-year-old male, pain after fracture. So it looks like they have a fracture of that mid uh, femoral diaphysis. So it's only like kind of the regular healing with a fluid collection within a defect, with, uh, like within the fracture, healed fracture defect. Small amount of edema still within the uh, fracture. So I guess I'd be, and you know, it looks like the edema is, you know, extending to the bones. So I'd be concerned, like similar to the other one, that there's a like focal collection, chronic abscess, and osteomyelitis. And that looks like a uh, sequestrum within a sinus tract, I believe. Good. That's exactly right. And then here you can see the tract going all the way out to the skin. Okay. Now, Jennifer. That's, that's probably the cause of the osteomyelitis. Yep. Right. Uh, so here we can see diffuse marrow edema surrounding the pubic symphysis and it looks like there's also some marrow edema in that left femoral head and neck junction um, so I'd be concerned about history of prior trauma um, this could be chronic osteomyelitis right that's what it was yeah. I noticed that there's a lot of fat here and very little muscle so this is also someone who's bedridden Okay, um, 63 year old female with increasing painful swelling over the symphysis pubis, fall open rami fracture two months ago, suture at local clinic. Um, I think uh, you can see that there is some lucency involving the pubic symphysis versus the rest of the bones. Um, and there might be even some irregularity of the inferior pubic rami bilaterally. I don't know if that's. Um, and on the MRI, you can see diffusely low T1 and increased T2 signal. 
um, involving the pubic symphysis and um, concerning for um, osteomyelitis after that local suture are repaired. And there's some increased muscular edema of the adductor muscles as well bilaterally. Um, so looks like osteo. Yep. Okay, Michael. Okay, so the um, there's marked abnormality of that pubic symphysis. Uh, you know, there's like bony erosions, destruction. There's, you know, like we don't see sharp cortical margins. Um, and now it's just it's kind of some ill-defined soft tissue, kind of intermediate density infiltration in the region. Um, on the CT, the I mean, we see the bony destruction and multiple little small little fragments, but there is a little bit like sharper borders than I thought, like within the defects. So it makes me think it's, you know, it could be like, yeah, osteolysis, and it's not necessarily infective. Yeah, this is probably infected, though, I believe. Okay. Okay, this is an IV drug abuser, and this is just a soft tissue infection extensively along the thigh with thickening of the thigh, and he was very, very sick. And uh, this came down from the ICU after IV drug abuse. Okay, Jennifer. Uh, so there is some cortical irregularity along the left greater trochanter. And then on the MRI images, we can see the cortical irregularity and then enhancing rim enhancing fluid collection adjacent to the left greater trochanter it looks concerning for an abscess and here we can see a focal osseous erosion within that greater trochanter and a fluid collection extending into the adjacent subcutaneous tissues so it's probably an intraosseous abscess as well as a soft tissue abscess yeah um, so that was infection. Here are just some uh, other examples of osteomyelitis here in the intertrochanteric, greater trochanteric regions here with adjacent. Yeah, this this now, well, to well, any of these five cases heal without uh, a surgical intervention. No, I'm sorry. So so, so the, 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 um, this was TB. Yeah. I I would think. Well, this one, the other case, though, I think that the abscess should be drained. Yeah, all, all abscesses need to be drained. It will not heal. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a, uh, you can give uh, 100 to 1 odds on that. Okay, uh, Ashu, increasing the okay. tip in. Uh, TB, we, uh, we're used to, uh, for instance, uh, well, let's get to TB. I'll talk about it then. Um, so this patient has increasing uh, left hip pain. There is uh, quite a bit of uh, marrow edema and irregularity of the cortical margins on the T1 and increased T2 signal at the sacroiliac joint and extending in the muscles, both in the iliacus and also in the gluteus medius. And um, showing us the lungs, it uh, looks like there is a Miliary pattern of multiple nodules throughout both lung fields. I'm guessing, given the discussion, it's TB. Yeah. Um, so, John, you were going to say something about TB? Um, I was going to say that uh, the treatment uh, the, um, in the old days used to be uh, fusion. Um, okay. Uh, we didn't TB have treatment other than. The, uh, fusion that was very very common in in Hong Kong and there was a doctor there um, who a lot of uh, physicians in orthopedics that were interested in infectious disease i.e. tuberculosis uh, his name was Hudson a British guy um, they would go visit him he he had tuberculosis coming out of his ears uh, and uh, one of my um, professors uh, uh, spent a year and it's just amazing how much tuberculosis uh, the East has, yeah. still has. Okay. All right. Uh, Michael. 
I was resistant to, to the drugs we used to use. Um, it was easy. The drugs were very effective. Now they're not. Yeah. Okay, so I believe this is like similar to my other case. I think the problems going on with the pubic symphysis was like a lucent lesion, kind of in the uh, in the left uh, pubic bone, greater than right, and there's a little bit of ill-defined cortex. And now we see this kind of large fluid collection uh, with rim enhancement evading into the uh, within the pubic symphysis, and it looks like it's fairly chronic, just looking at the edges of the bone. So it's a word for like a chronic osteomyelitis and abscess or type infection, and and a lot of a lot of fluid collection here. So what kind of organism do you think could cause something like this? Well, I guess we just talked about TB. So TB, uh, they got yeah. you know big lymph nodes bilaterally. Yeah, it's expected to be much more aggressive, or staph or strep or something like that. So yeah, it looks like the bones have time to remodel. And you can see some lymphadenopathy here on both sides, and this was tuberculosis. Okay, Jennifer. A 29-year-old with left hip pain last month and no other information. Um, it looks like there's a fluid signal intensity collection in that left iliopsoas muscle. Um, and also, yeah, also proximally as well as along the femur um, and diffuse surrounding a Edema. This is probably another intramuscular abscess. Yeah, it's really wow, going okay, along the so, there, right? Iliopsoas abscess. So. Uh, and then we have the post-contrast images. Now we can see rim enhancement throughout the fluid collection compatible with an abscess. Patient was called to new images. Oh, wow. Okay, so this extends. It's very extensive throughout the entire left iliopsoas muscle, and even it looks like there's a tract extending to that left lateral abdomen. I'm not sure if that was the initial site of introduction of the abscess. Um, it, there's increased signal on the diffusion images and diffuse rim enhancement. Um, I'd ask about if there were prior injury or maybe a stab wound. Uh, prior surgery for TB and HIV positive. Yeah, 13 years ago. So this is a, is it a chronic abscess at the incision site? Yes. That's weird. Um, so that's retroperitoneal abscess. abscess. Then I went down about the iliopsoas muscle all the way down to its insertion. But this all came from, from the yes. incision here for the Every every time you have an incision, whether whether it's in the operating room or in the outside world, uh, the outside world is more commonly infective than the hospital. Most hospitals, not not every hospital, I suppose. Okay, so uh, let me see, Ashley, what do you think of this one? <laughs> uh, 14 year old male with cough, fever, chills, right hip pain, altered mental status two weeks after hiking in Yosemite. Um, looks like there's a retrocardiac capacity and possible small um, left pleural fusion. There's increased opacities within the mid to lower left lung as well. Um, arrows are pointing at the left tentorium dural enhancement um, concerning for uh, intracranial infection. And then there's increased edema of that right hip and a hip effusion, and there's an abscess, I think, medial to the acetabular rim as well, enhancing abscess, a small one. Oh, and then there's increased signal kind of um, along the left side too, but I was talking just medial to the, uh, to the right there, yeah. I don't know. Um, so it looks like a pretty systemic infection kind of everywhere. I don't know if this patient has an amino, oh, okay, so it's plague. I was thinking immunodeficiency or something. Uh, that, that's a good thought. But the, and then here you can see, it's basically everywhere. This was the plague. Yeah. And this just osteomyelitis with a fracture, and you can see a lot of the uh, bony changes from osteomyelitis in this particular patient. And here's just a big abscess in the soft tissues. Very early MR scans, back in the very early days. Um, before the birth of our uh, fellows, John. <laughs> That's about right. 
Okay, Michael, what do you think of this one? Okay, uh, so on that left femur, it looks like there's some medullary edema kind of in the intertrochanteric region, also involved in the lesser trochanter, and the surrounding muscular edema, and then there's a like intra, uh, intramedullary cyst, which just looks pretty simple. Um, and then there's some fluid tracking along kind of the deeper fascia overlying the, uh, between the subcutaneous and the muscle. A lot of hibernation here, which yeah. I think is chronic. With that cyst, it kind of looks kind of chronic finest. Now we see a lot of edema within the uh, gluteus maximus and the uh, soft tissues immediately posterior to the femur with a cyst and break in the cortex. So I'm wondering if this is like a, yeah, now you can see it here as well. Like I'm wondering if this is like chronic infection with a sinus tract and drainage. Yeah, 30 year old osteomyelitis in the bone and it can be dormant you have for any, a long like, time. Prior yeah. trauma or do we know? Uh, I don't know the original cause of the osteomyelitis, but he was treated 30 mm -hmm. years ago. And it was dormant for 25 years, and then he presented with this. Uh, uh, it was the same type of organism, so they can, <clears throat> can sit there for a long time. We used to say that once osteo, always osteo. Mm -hmm. um, don't do that anymore, I don't think. Right. Okay, Jennifer. Um, so here we can see a cephalomedullary screw and nails associated with a healed proximal femur fracture, and there's cortical irregularity. It looks like perhaps some peri periosteal reaction along the lesser trochanter, um, and there's some lucency in the adjacent cortex, and there may be some periosteal reaction. So I'm concerned this could be a chronic infection. Well, it's quite common to have a fracture of that uh, area when you have an endotrochanteric comminuted fracture. That's uh, lesser choke is, is frequently fractured. So that, that uh, part can be part of the fracture. But what else is going on is, uh, well, you and John talk about it. Yeah, I guess we have some more radiographs for them. Six months later, it looks like they removed the hardware. We can still see evidence of prior fracture and that there's sclerosis now. Wow, okay. So there's... And, and that's the problem with removing our... Yeah. There's yeah. diffuse osseous destruction within that proximal femoral head and neck and intertrochanteric region and surrounding fluid and joint effusion. It looks like there may be some rim enhancement and also diffuse edema in that left acetabulum. So I'm concerned about, oh, another abscess there in the adductor muscles. This looks like infection. Yeah, after the, the, last thing, the last thing that your, your struly would do was would, would remove the a nail and plate. Uh, you don't do that because once you mobilize it, this patient will never, never heal. When you stop immobilization, so um, you you open it up and you drain the hell out of it. Uh, that's what, the way you treat these. Uh, you don't remove the devices. So even if they say we they tap the joint and the joint fluid was positive, you would still leave the hardware in? Um, what do I mean, that joint? Like if we knew that it was infected and there was a positive aspiration and cultures with the hardware in, you can, you, you can still leave the hardware in? Like well, I'm wondering if the hardware can be a nidus for infection. There's no way to treat it uh, once you remove the hardware. See, that's the only thing that's keeping that uh, hip together is that hardware. Um, the infection will make it fall apart if, if you, once you remove the hardware. So you treat it with I, IV antibiotics, uh, maximum dosing and um, close observation, even if you, um, you obviously would get an infectious disease expert to help you, but you have osteomyelitis here, I mean osteo, um, uh, in other words,
was you have arthritis here also, but uh, what do you do once you remove it? What happens now that the bone falls apart? Uh, yeah, I've it, seen these not do very really well, but uh, uh, the, the, most ones, the most recent the most recent ones I've seen like this who have had ID. Look at them. The ID people will always have forced a surgeon to take out the hardware. Uh, now, I uh, did you say? Uh, did they say take out the hardware? Yeah. Uh, if, the if, I've seen. If, the, if the fracture is definitely healed, right? Yes. You you you, you would. Yeah. That it is no question. Yeah. But I'm not sure that this is completely healed yet. Oh, you might. Uh, that that could be an issue. Uh, and most that's of the these problem. that I, yeah, I've seen some in fractures. Certainly, they occur. Lately, the most most of the ones I've seen have been in uh, hip replacements. And as, as we know from the lecture we had a few months ago, there's a significantly higher rate of, of infection in people who have robotic surgery for joint replacements than the old-fashioned way where you don't have robotic surgery. And, uh, uh, the total hip replacements, a different ball of wax from nails, John. Yeah, right. Okay. So that, that's entirely different right. from what we're dealing with here. Uh, they they guess because of the symptoms they're prob probably moving as if wasn't as painful as they thought or whatever, or uh, something made them think that this was healed. Otherwise probably, they wouldn't move it. Right, right. But you can uh, see total, it still total, total, some joints, have, total joint replacements have to be removed. Right. And they have uh, joints that, that that they with antibiotics and yeah. them uh, made out of material that I can't remember. Uh, right. they, they put those in as and a they put spacer, in. Right. spacer, and the spacer stays there until for, for six months until they heal, and then they replace the hip right. if the infection is gone. Yeah. Ashu. Um, so it's a 10-year-old male. We're looking at the femur. Uh, the right femur. It looks like there might be some minimal periosteal reaction along the anterior lateral aspect of the right femur, mid diaphysis. Yep, right there. Um, oh, okay, on the MR, much more easily to see the uh, diffuse periosteal reaction, um, especially anteriorly. There is a uh, small sequestrum. There's probably um, uh, right there internally, and this is concerning for osteomyelitis. Um, yeah. Well, what do you think on that? On, 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 uh, X-ray, and you can see the uh, MRI too. What what do they call that? The sequestrum, you mean? No, I was talking about onion skin, John. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Right. On that, right. Um, it's, it's, it's when you see that, you think of uh, osteo. Yeah. yeah think of osteo, and uh, but also malignant neoplasms can have a similar type. type yeah. Uh, yeah. Periosteal reaction, especially osteosarcoma. Uh, right. Okay, uh, Michael. Okay, 15 year old male, one month of thigh pain. Uh, so there's marked intramedullary hyperintense signal with kind of pericortical soft tissue signal. It looks pretty diffuse and uniform. On axial T1 weighted images, you see that kind of low signal intensity and kind of maybe mild periosteal reaction and thickening. Um, I mean, my first thought was thinking like, oh, some like chronic osteomyelitis, but there's not really a lot of, the bone doesn't, like there's not that much bony change. Um, So I'm wondering if it's some other inflammatory lesion, type lesion. Uh, it's EG or Langerhans cell. Yeah. So the, the, other, th yeah, the other thing you have to realize in younger people, I'm going to tend to early teens, is the acidophilic granuloma, which can be focal or it can be uh, involve a much larger area. And these kids can be very sick and it can look a lot like infection, uh, but it's treated differently. So always just remember EG, you know, if you're dealing with a young 
a young person. Ewing, Ewing looks like yeah. that also. Yeah, uh, this would be a little bit unusual location. Certainly if it were in the tibia, I'd be concerned about that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. My, uh, I, I think I told a story where my chief wanted to amputate a two-year-old's leg. Right. Well, I beg to be able to aspirate and get the pus out. <laughs> uh, Jennifer. Um, this is a 22-year-old female. There is cortical thickening and kind of increased density in that distal femoral diaphysis. So it looks like chronic remodeling. I guess this could be chronic osteomyelitis. Right. Yep. This may be treated before. I can't tell. Ashu? Um, 54-year-old female with right thigh and mass pass history is uh, n s no, no. non-specific non-specific okay um looks like uh there's some increased soft tissue and maybe some even gas on the i don't i don't know it looks like quite lucent on the that frog like you and it looks it looks like it's medial oh okay i guess there's just a focal cystic collection with um, per, some peripheral vascularity and a uh, and some nodularity. Um, it might be debris layering posteriorly. Um, uh, looks like, like the post contrast images doesn't look like it's enhancing very much, and it looks quite cystic. Um, there is a little bit of uh, internal. I guess it's internal enhancement there. So I kind of be worried about a, um, a malignancy, but. I guess we're in the inflammation section, so oh, okay, cystic psychosis. Yeah, uh, usually you'll see multiple lesions with cystic psychosis, but you can't just have one lesion with a little cyst in it there. The little one, um, uh, it's a larvae of the tapeworm. So Typically, CNS is the primary infection site, but then it can be everywhere. I think we'll see some examples where it's really everywhere. Intramuscular is actually not a common location for involvement. And it goes through the pig, and you basically get it for not cooking uh, the meat adequately enough. Still endemic in Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America with uncooked pork. Okay, uh, Michael. Um, 72 year old male, buttock pain with palpable mass for one month, known stomach cancer post subtotal gastrectomy. And um, so there is this. Uh, kind of mild irregular lobulated and multi-septated cystic structure right there in the kind of left posterior groin right along the it looks like it's right along the ischium um i mean i guess first thing you know you give history of well not well first thing i was looking at is like oh is there some sort of kind of necrotic met metastatic disease but going back on the axials it just looks like a big non-specific fluid collection in that region, I don't know if they've had trauma or I don't really know what that looks like on gross pathology. Yeah. Um, Doesn't look like a cyst. You can see the vessels going there. No. So issue glue, oh, it's just a big bursal effusion and inflammation. Yeah, so if we okay. go back, this is really coming right out of where the hamstrings, right near where the hamstrings are yeah, originating yeah. through here. And this so this doesn't have to do anything with this cancer then? No, it had nothing to do with his cancer. It's basically a chronic tear of the original hamstrings with secondary bursitis. Granulation tissue, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Jennifer. Okay, so we have a 68 year old female with left hip pain for months. Um, it looks like there's focal fluid collection in the left. I think this is a pilomated image. Okay, so it's just some fat then within the left, or hemorrhage within the left quadratus femoris muscle. Um, and now here it looks like we have some T2 images. Um, it does look like there's fluid collections in the bilateral quadratus femoris muscles, and there is some debris. I wonder if this could be another bursitis, a chronic bursitis. Um, 
with debris, or I guess it could also be synovial chondromatosis extending from the hip joint. Okay, so we can see some, oh, or lipoma arborescens. <laughs> right, so so I guess these are all fat. Chronic synovitis, chronic, chronic uh, you know, uh, synovial thickening, and then you get, you get uh, lipid deposits within it, and so it's lipoma arborescens. So can that occur in any joint? Because I feel like I only see examples of it in the knee. I think it's primarily seen in the knee, but it can be anywhere. But it's it's pretty uncommon outside of the knee. It's pretty uncommon inside the knee as well. Yep. Uh, just remember, these are uh, unusual cases for the most part. Right. Yep. Okay, last case, Ashu. Um, so we're looking at two coronal uh, fluid sensitive sequences with fat saturation. Don't see much here. Oh, oh, okay. Well, it looks like I really couldn't tell on the coronal images, but on the yeah. axial images, the first set of images are, I think, fluid sensitive sequences. You can see diffuse muscular edema. There's maybe some sparing of the a few adductors. So yeah, I'd be worried about myositis and. Yeah, usually this is much more obvious on the coronal stir images. I don't know why this is not as obvious as it should be. So why don't we stop here and we'll continue talking about inflammatory lesions, uh, getting into some of the more interesting ones uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's Wednesday. Thursday. Okay. All right. Have thank you. Good one, everybody.